Let's take a look at a slightly more advanced application of the Gabor Granger method. It's important to keep in mind that there's really not much different in this example and the more simple example, but it can sometimes be useful to see some of the ways we work around some of the data collection problems or modeling challenges associated with Gabor Granger. In this example, let's imagine that we're a company that sells uh, yoga meditation subscriptions to small businesses. Pretty groovy. You get all these people feeling very uh, zen right there. We've tested a couple different monthly price points between $100 and $180. And just as we did previously, uh, we did ask people to evaluate their purchase intentions for this service um, across these different price points. What's different in this scenario is we didn't have each person respond to all five different price points. Instead, we randomly presented each of our 400 survey respondents with only two of the options presented in random order. This is a bit more realistic. We really wouldn't believe that we could rely on somebody to look at the same exact stimuli with just different price points and stay engaged or not have their results contaminated by their evaluation of previous options. So by reducing this down to two, or just as easily as could have been one, uh, we have a little more faith in the quality of the data that we've collected. Um, note, sometimes little strange things can happen here. Um, for example, if we presented these in random order, it could entirely be possible when someone is exposed to it the second time, they realize they have a more favorable attitude about the uh, stimuli. So sometimes you might see these sort of flips. Now, just as we did previously, we have to take these uh, purchase intention answers and map them onto purchase probabilities. So again, I won't go down and show you all 400 of them, but we do the exact same thing as we did previously. We use a VLOOKUP table here to pull them up. The only difference is I have wrapped the VLOOKUP around an IF ERROR check uh, the if error was just looking to see if uh, the VLOOKUP fails because there's a blank value. And if there's a blank value, it will in fact return yet another uh, blank value here through here. Okay. So now that we've had our data collected, we've mapped it onto probabilities. We go ahead and do the exact same thing we did previously. Specifically, we just take the average. of purchase probabilities for each of the uh, price points. No problem. We see according to this, under our assumptions that definitely will buys will buy 60% of the time, definitely will not buys will still buy 2% of the time. Uh, if those assumptions are correct, uh, on average, we would expect about 50.6 people, or I'm sorry, businesses to buy at $100. Here we've done something a little different though, where we've not only plotted the average purchase probabilities, but we also pro we also plotted sort of an optimistic and less optimistic scenario by taking not only the average, but then subtracting the standard deviation from it using the simple stdev.s function in Excel. And we also add a standard deviation here. And we're going to be using plus and minus one standard deviation of from the mean to represent sort of our optimistic and less optimistic scenarios of what percent of people will, will really buy. Now that we have uh, three different uh, averages of purchase probabilities estimated, we now have to calibrate our logit models. And again, we do the exact same thing we did previously. We just do it three times. So our logit model here for the average Again, we search across uh, the cap of the maximum, and we just make sure that the model never predicts more than a 50.6% chance. We have two additional parameters that we need to calibrate, our intercept and slope down in the denominator, if you will. We do the exact same thing for our conservative model, our less optimistic model. We also have to estimate a unique intercept and slope parameter and we also set our cap to our uh, to our maximum here. At this point, we can just go ahead and calibrate the parameters for each one of the three models. You could attempt to try to do it simultaneously in Solver by summing up all the squared errors together and optimizing by minimizing this and varying all six parameters. But that's a bit uh, much for Solver and it'll sometimes fail to work. Uh, so it's a little bit easier maybe just do it one at a time. Do it quickly here. So let's do our first one. Objective here. Changing these two parameters exactly as we've done previously. 
and hopefully they don't change. Already we already have a pretty well-fitting model. And then just to show you it working, let's imagine I set this last one to zero and zero. Obviously we know we should be able to do better. Let's try to minimize our some of the squared error there. Changing those two parameters, and let's go. Nice. If we look down here at the bottom, we can see that we plotted our three curves on a single chart across different price points. So now we can observe the probability of purchase or the percent of people in that market that we think will purchase at different price points. What's nice about this is we can see sort of a confident, underconfident, and typical estimate of what will happen. It's pretty important. Uh, if we looked at just an average curve, we would have thought that at uh, about $135, 30% of the market would buy. But an optimistic estimate would say actually 30% of the people would buy at $150. Or a conservative version of the estimate would say, well, actually you have to sell more like about $116 to get 30% of the market. So you can test hypothetical scenarios and do sensitivity analysis with any of the ways that you uh, use this information in the financial projections this way. That adds a layer of uh, flexibility and power to anything you might derive from the Gabor Granger method.